All right, we are recording. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ridge Cresswell. If you do not know me, I am a... Uh, I'm getting increasingly frustrated trying to describe my job. Uh, I have narrated audiobooks. I do lots of other things. Uh, I live here in Queens, New York with uh, the TGI founder, Trina Thibodeau. I'm pointing behind me because she's in the kitchen. You can kind of see her in both frames right now. Um, at any rate, we gather here once a week uh, for about an hour to have a reading. And, uh, you know, we are also trying to build a bit of community. So again, you know, hanging out after the fact um, and just kind of uh, connecting people to people. Um, Trina often says this whole thing runs on friendship. You know, everyone who's here right now pretty much is like friend of a friend or relative of a friend. Um, and by this point, I think we're up to friend of a friend of a friend of a, et cetera. Um, and I, I, it's really been wonderful during this time when we're unable to do all the things we normally do and unable to, you know, uh, go out to an event or do whatever it is. It's really nice to be able to have this time to dedicate to, um, I would say for me, I dedicate this time to artistry, to craft, to feelings, to uh, truth, to whatever it is people are trying to express through their work. And I think it's an absolute honor for me to get to sit here and host it. I've said this many times, but basically Trina came up with this idea. And then the day before the first one, she goes, and you're going to host it. So I did, I did what I had to do. Anyways, um, I don't think there's particularly any house. Oh, a little piece of housekeeping. As we said, this thing runs on friendship. So if you yourself or any writers you know, uh, know somebody, if someone has something coming out, if they just want to get on and read something, uh, send them our way. We actually just had a shift. We have the first individual involved in the organization of this thing who is not myself or Trina. So you can talk to our new booker, or I told her if she wanted to be really corporate, we could call her the talent relations officer. Noli Reed is joining on to help us out um, because Trina has to go back to work in the New York City school system. And I, if anyone has tried, you'll know, am terrible at responding to emails. So we're really appreciative to have some, have some help. Uh, that's one piece of business. The other piece of business, uh, just because it feels weird not addressing it, this is the first year in the past 18 years where like, it didn't even register with me that this is the anniversary of anything because of how crummy the world is going in general. Which I, I'm not saying it for any reason other than it was startling to sort of like see on a bank sign the date today and go like, oh, right. Huh. Um, what that says about the state of the world, what that says about the state of the country, who knows? Uh, that's beyond the scope of this four-minute intro that is already too long. Uh, but maybe it's something that'll come up in our conversations during the show. So without any further, I'm really trying to not say adieu anymore. Uh, so I'm going to say without any for further foo for raw, I would like to introduce our first reader. And the first sentence of this bio, I am already fascinated. T.J. Butler lives on a sailboat on Maryland's Chesapeake Bay with her husband and dog and writes fiction and essays that are not all fun and games. She's a Pushcart Prize nominee and a regular contributor to Tiny House Magazine. Her work appears or is forthcoming in Pembroke, Flash Fiction Online, Tahoma Literary Review, New South, and others. Her debut collection of short stories, A Flame on the Ocean, is forthcoming from Adelaide Books in 2021. You can find her on Twitter at a gal with no name and at tjbutlerauthor.com. So with that, TJ, you can unmute and oh, I just muted you because you did unmute. I'm sorry. <laughs> you can unmute yourself and there we go and take it away. Hi there. Um, thank you all so much for coming to this reading to listen to me. Um, my book is coming out in Q4 2021, so you'll never remember it, but I might be back at that point. Um, I'm going to read two, um, two passages. The first is from the title story, A Flame on the Ocean. She's never been out west. The widows of Carrick Bend have never been there either. Years and husbands have passed for them, and whether they once cared or not has been long forgotten. But she is to stay at the anchor, to be weighed down by the crushing load of the actual anchor the bar has become, she knows she will no longer care either. When the sun rises in a few hours, K 
Carrick Bend will hold nothing but countless bleak and identical seasons of men passing through, but none staying. She opens a bottle, drops the hesitates. She tips the bottle and a small puddle forms at her feet. Nothing happens. She is motionless. This can still be undone. It is not too late to set the bottle on the bar. She could tack another note to Alma's door, asking her to take over while she sorts things out. She could drive through the Appalachian Mountains, find a westbound interstate in Pennsylvania, and make the rest up as she drove. She knows Alma would, would relish the chance to step in. However, she also knows she'd eventually point her car east again. She'd settle back into the anchor's rhythms in her too small apartment filled with her parents' remnants. She'd wait for Mickey Baring's seasonal greeting and tell stories to traveling men about the carvings on the bar for the rest of her days. Mickey and his crew could make their home in any port, but she'd be forever beholden to Carrick Bend. She does not know how to proceed other than by removing the possibility of the anchor shackling her further. She splashes rum on the floor as she paces to each of the most substantial support beams. She flings a bottle haphazardly to cover them and the adjacent walls with liquid. A feeling of, an of anticipation rises in her chest. She is light on her feet, splattering walls and tables. She splashes the aged, decorative monkey fist knots that hang from the rafters, the roughly hewn, knotted planks of the floor, and finally, the wooden bar with its stories of her girlhood. The iron potbelly stoves on each end of the room are cold and empty. She leaves them dry, knowing they will survive this. She has emptied the bottle and sets it down carefully. She unclasps the chain from around her neck without touching the seabird and drops it to the floor. What was once the freedom of a bird in flight now seems to be an albatross that no longer has a place around her neck. She plucks a matchbook from a bowl behind the bar, slings her bag over her shoulder, walks toward the door. She glances at the plaque that bears her father's name and her heart catches. It belongs to the anchor, not to her or any new false home she can place it in. She strikes one match, holds it toward the book. Her face glows orange as the book catches with a hiss. She tosses the matches into the first puddle she made. It ignites. A channel of flame moves toward the beams at a startling measure. As the fire licks the first beam, luminous offshoots find the walls. She imagines this new fleeting network of ignition looks similar to the bayou vines she has never seen, but she has no desire to observe the rest of the combustion. She opens a door and steps into the fresh night air. Her car is parked in the gravel lot behind the bar and she sees that the flames are not yet visible from outside. The anchor has no windows, so the bonfire glow will only appear as it devours her second floor apartment. By that time, her car will be just another vehicle on the long and lonely interstate. So I'll stop there. And um, the second one is called The Numbers Man. On the second Tuesday in June, a small airplane flew low over the river that bisected Helena, West Virginia into six blocks of downtown and 12 blocks of uptown. A banner with a message printed in large block lettering tra trailed the plane. Downtown traffic slowed at the noise. Drivers pressed against their seat belts and gazed over the aging two-story brick storefront. People running errands stepped from the shops onto the cracked sidewalks, five and dime merchandise still in their hands. Everyone cocked their heads toward the river. Uptown, people stood in doorways gaping, faces upturned and lunches forgotten. Dogs on sagging porches raised their heads, ears pricked at the unfamiliar droning from above. Helena was far from commercial airplanes flight paths, and small planes had few reasons to stray this far into coal country. People craned their necks toward the sky and squinted into the bright blue to make out the banner's words, the numbers man. Those who shielded their eyes at the wrong moment missed the apparent cloudburst that poured from the plane's underside. It trailed behind the plane for barely a breath. The plume fell, separating into tiny shapes as it descended. Helena's collective eyes, all gazing at the same phenomenon, settled on the drifting, cascading shapes. Was it a flock of miniature wingless birds? A storm of buoyant hailstones? Thousands of ping pong balls, each with a black number, fell with a deafening clatter. 
They ricocheted on the asphalt, the old cars, the leaking rooftops, and then the citizens themselves. Few thought to take shelter. Instead, they froze, engrossed in the spectacle. Balls landed in shopping bags and baby carriages. They bounced into lowered car windows. Shops with doors open to the breeze flooded with balls and they filled the spaces between shelves and racks. The balls covered sidewalks and rolled down the streets in a flash flood of white plastic. The gutters clogged and the balls piled against car tires like snowdrifts. The citizens were dumbfounded by the cacophony. They scrambled to gather the balls at their feet, unsure of their significance, but confident that secrets would be revealed. Someone let out a cry and they knew the numbers man would be there soon. Lottie Voss did not stand on her porch starstruck during either grand display. Both times, she was getting ready for work, insulated by the hairdryer and the accompanying bustle that precedes a cocktail shift at the Fortune Hill Casino and Racetrack. Those too young to remember the last visit from the numbers man, almost a generation ago, were related to someone who did. Those who remembered it had not been to the event themselves, but they knew someone who had. Few souls in town did not have a story about the numbers man that they could retell with confidence. Each one began with the person who was at the event, their barber's brother, their cousin's fiance, the third shift foreman who had the job two winters before the mine closed. The third shift foreman told his own story and it was in fact the superintendent who was there. It was said that those who'd been there and received a ticket with a number, or maybe they selected a ticket from a deep bowl, or perhaps they heard a number read from a ticket and raised their arms with fierce intensity to claim it, received their true number at the event. Those people came away with answered prayers. The streetcar operator's wife, or was it his sister, had a healthy baby after two stillborns. Some said she already had the baby and had recovered from the measles without consequences. The coat check girl at Lawson's department store, or was it the nurse at Dr. Sharp's office? won the bingo jackpot at the Protestant Revival Church three weeks in a row. Others remembered her winning the Superfecta on the ponies at the new track in Charleston. Helena's populace agreed that there were many truths to be told. When each retelling of the legend offered an incredible bounty, none questioned the lore and its variations. And I'll stop there. All right, thank you, TJ. Those were excellent, very, um very curious about the numbers, man. Want to know more. So I'm, I'm greatly looking forward to, I know it, we got to wait a while, but I'm, I'm greatly looking forward to it. I would say, um, you know, the second, um, put, uh, putting, um, maybe this is overanalyzing, but putting, um, the sort of American dream, which, uh, you know, this instant, this, this, that we'll just do the right thing and then we'll be hugely successful, we'll get everything we want, whatever it is, putting that into context and juxtaposing this sort of like mythical, almost, is it a, is it a boon or a boogeyman? It's hard to tell. Uh, and the, uh, particularly the balls with numbers on them, like the lottery imagery, um, really, Ooh, I don't know. It it gives me um, it's like so potentially sinister and also so hopeful at the same time. And I find that balance really exhilarating and fascinating. I think that's really cool. Um, and uh, oh, people are asking if they can follow you on social media. I can put her Twitter link in the chat, or you can you can say if you want. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Sure. Um, so I'll do that, but uh, then the 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 first one, um, you know, the, much more felt, much more sort of grounded in reality. But I, I the, some of the language in there was really magnificent. I actually wrote down um, she doesn't know how to proceed other than loosening the anchor around her ankle, like that. That sort of such a perfect encapsulation of like desperation and and hearing this woman, you know that decision to, to escape the things that have trapped us, especially to do with family, things like that. That's so relatable. And I feel like I may have to ask, given that you did report living on a sailboat, <laughs> is this, is it, does this have anything to do with your real life or is this just sort of like metaphorical or, or made up? No, actually, um, you know, that song, um, 
hey ruby you're a fine girl what mm -hmm. a good wife you will make so this is ruby so um it's brandy actually but brandy i couldn't name the girl brandy so ruby is another girl's name um this is brandy's story oh she loves a man who's not around he comes back periodically um brandy has a chain of gold around her neck so um Ruby has a seabird. It is, if you listen to the lyrics of Brandy, You're a Fine Girl, mm. it is, it's the story. Okay, that's fascinating. I think that's an awesome place to find inspiration because that's sort of the, that song is, if you think about what the guy is saying, is is massively insensitive to whoever this woman is. Yeah, right? he's kind of a dick. Yes, that, that's a shorter way. That's a quicker way of saying it. <laughs> anyway, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much. So people, you can uh, find TJ on Twitter at a gal with no name or go to tjbutlerauthor.com. Um, when the book is coming out, like, please reach out to us. We'll, we'll, we'd be happy to have you back. And we've been doing a podcast as well. Anything we can do to help promote things. So thank you so much. Oh, of course. Thank you. All right. Also, um, readers, uh, I don't know if you put it on gallery view, but people do clap or, or sign language clap. And uh, I can't, we don't have to get into the thing about how I can't do jazz hands. Not again. All right. Our, ne our next, uh, it's very stream of consciousness here, as I'm sure you guys can tell. Our next reader is Terry Ellen Cross Davis. She's the author of A More Perfect Union, winner of the 2019 Journal slash Charles B. Wheeler Poetry Prize, and will be published in February 2021 by Mad Creek Books. She's also the author of Haint. 2016 from Givall Press, winner of the 2017 Ohioana Book Award for Poetry. She's the 2020 winner of the Poetry Society of America uh, Robert H. Winner Memorial Award and a finalist for the PSA's George Bogan Memorial Award. She's a recipient of, the, of a 2019 Sustainable Arts Grant and a merit grant from the Freya Project. She is a Cave Canem Fellow and a member of the Black Ladies Brunch Collective, and she's been awarded residencies at the Community of Writers Workshop, Hedgebrook, the Soul Mountain Writers Retreat, Virginia Center for Creative Arts, and the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown. Her work has been published in many anthologies. Uh, the list is very long. In the interest of brevity, I will not read all of them, but many anthologies. So her work is out there if you guys want to find it. And she also is currently the poetry coordinator uh, for the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C., and she lives in Maryland with her husband, the poet Hayes Davis, and their two children. I will put her Twitter and website into the chat. There you go. And Terry, you can take it away. I think you should be unmuted. All right, great. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Trina, and thank you, Ridge, um, for having me on tonight. Um, TJ, great work, a necrastic story. Um, <laughs> and so I'll start with um, this poem. I, I had the privilege to go to Ireland uh, two summers in a row. Um, and so this poem reflects on that. I love Ireland. Don't, don't, you know, the poem may make you think differently, but I really love Ireland. Um, so this poem is called A Black Woman Gets a Window Seat on Aer Lingus. Enough, Ireland, for all your lush effusion of color, inside me blooms a masochistic loneliness. Give me the screws I know best, the policeman quick to test my yes sir as assetless, trigger the Midwest. Never on the Bible, never on the school test was this. Crucifixion kills, not nails into feet or wrists, but weight borne upon the breast. You suffocate slowly in your own flesh. As I return to the upright cross of the US, I breathe easier, I breathe less. Um, and this poem is called The Goddess of Scars. Uh, I made up a whole bunch of goddesses in my, in my new collection, and this is one of them. The Goddess of Scars. I mark you with melanin, a crosshatch of collagen. Better the scar than the loss of limb. Better the clean line, raised itched, than the festering wound beckoning death. My apostles, my keloids, my tropic, my contractures, my hypertropic response. Each a love I bear to the mammal of you, the ruptured vessel, the broken in dermis. Consider my evolution a song to survival. Consider cells my priests, their work a ladder of 
a ladder of prayer, each stitch an epistle. I grieve to see you separate from yourself. My atonement is a bridge to build you back together. While you can never be born again, you can recover. Each time I sign you, witness the parable of action and consequence. I do not think you show enough reverence. You were never meant to be a smooth canvas, but a texture, a testament. I bless you with a story, and each and every time you live to tell the tale. So uh, this poem is called Partis Sequitur Ventrum, which is a Latin phrase that stands for the principle that the children of an enslaved woman are themselves born as slaves and owned by their mother's master. It's in two sections, the first section, mourning. His knobby six-year-old knees, his anxious pace as if to keep step with the question steady overflow. Is there a giant octopus in the Bermuda Triangle? How is paper made? How do fireworks know when to explode? No one told me black boys could burn so bright. Wait, I am wrong. The dark sky has seen their fire snuffed by white hoods, malevolent blue eyes and bluer uniforms, white women's screams, all have been matched to their tender wood. So I hug my son tight, kiss the curl crop so close it's straight. My mother's eye insatiable. He is dessert and I'll always have seconds. Each morning I lick my thumb, clean him up good, wishing in vain the amniotic sac had dried to armor. Two, night. His lisp, loose, syrupy, sweet, sneaks into my ear. Feel its heat, small source more flicker than flame, flanked by arms still dreaming of muscle. He claims my squishy stomach the best pillow. If the security of our locked arms could extend beyond growth spurts, clocks, calendars, to the someone interviewing him, to the someone following him in the store, to the someone holding my son's life in trembling fingers poised above a phone's keypads. Let my love be a note safety pinned to his chest. Send him back alive, unharmed. As a black mother in America, I know my wells are birthright, pinned with iron, pinned in ink. Um, and this last poem, um, is called, this poem suggests revolution. And I will say my therapist uh, deserves some credit. She told me to lean into my anger, and so I did. This poem suggests revolution. This poem no longer consents to play mammy or to wet nurse a seething rage at her own black teeth. America, your teeth have come in, you nip too much. This poem refuses to play religion. A Bible verse will not absolve you, America. If the pursuit of happiness, life, and liberty came from the creator, she is about ready to backhand you in the face. This poem will not be your bottom bitch, America. This poem does not consent to blackness being window dressing for the diversity brochure of a country where the board of directors never changed. This poem reads the fine print on you, America. This poem consents to be black ink, a clenched fist, pepper spray, and black souls marching on asphalt. Freedom for and from you, America. If need be, this poem consents to double as witness, the dotted I in the missing respirations decree. Until then, let this poem heckle you, America. Let it yell, goddamn U.S., choke on cotton, while fanning itself and the flames. Understand, this poem doesn't want to be bloodthirsty. It would rather write about the cleanse of a cloudburst than the ventral force of a water hose. In truth, this poem courts hope. Like a volta, it wants to turn the page, writing, America, let us pin a new document. Not a perpetual union, but a chokehold removed, as a black throat breathing freely is a self-evident truth. Let these lines be facts submitted to a candid world. And this poem, when spoken or read, let it alter, let it abolish you. Thank you. Wow, Terry, thank you so much. That's that's incredibly powerful. Um, all three of, or all of four, four of them. I'm, I'm bad. I got I got 
Sometimes I have this thing where sometimes uh, I, I have find this experience with as someone who doesn't read a lot of poetry if, or has recently started to do some more, especially when someone's reading it. It's like I describe it as like this um, uh, some sort of invisible hand that goes inside me and just like finds a, a new button of feeling and pushes it and just goes like, yeah, feel this right now. And it kind of tend to get lost intellectually a little bit. Um, but, you know, I mean, first of all, just, just that the last line of, you know, the first, the first poem, um, you know, I breathe easier, I breathe less. Um, the, that, that idea of like the familiarity of being on guard and, and being maybe slightly afraid or either afraid or just, you know, knowing that where you're going isn't necessarily safe um, is so, that's such a perfect way of describing it. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it's, it's obviously difficult to impossible for, for myself uh, to understand the experience of black Americans, like physically, because there is a physical component to it. You know, this is, there's a physical component to trauma and there's a intergenerational component to trauma, you know, and this is generations of fear and difficulty. Um, and that's actually why I'm so glad that you got to write and also just the way you delivered that final poem, because the opposite of holding your breath is letting yourself get angry enough to say something and, and letting yourself get to a point where you have to say, this is completely unacceptable. We're not doing this anymore. You know? And I mean, I saw an article today and we don't have to get into it, but I saw an article today that was written by a psychologist that just ba basically framed the relationship between the American people and our current president as an abusive relationship. <laughs> and it's like, everyone sort of nods and yes, but it's like, but there are lots of citizens of this country who have been in an abusive relationship with it for like, since before it was a country. And, uh, you know, I can hear uh, in the poem about your son, you know, the, just the love and care and like playfulness and joy that you feel in interacting with him. And then it, the fact that it comes with this sadness of not knowing what, what this country is going to do to or for him yeah. is heartbreaking. Um, so again, I, I, I don't really have a question or anything, just, just more like, thank you for, for coming and sharing that. I mean, this is, you know, the kind of things that, I find for myself, like I need productive, I need to feel sad. And then I also need productive anger. I need anger that makes me go out in the street. I need anger that makes me volunteer, donate. It's a, I don't need anger that makes me go on Twitter and write something snarky. That's not going <laughs> to help anybody. <laughs> Um, so, uh, yeah, people are asking in the chat, uh, where, where your work avail is available. The goddess poem in particular, that's from your new book. That's out. That's forthcoming. Correct. Right. And it, it was actually just printed in the Kenyan review in the oh, okay. October issue. So, okay. So. Yeah. Yeah. So that there are, I, I apologize for not reading the full list of journals, but you, you have, uh, <laughs> an extensive publication history. So people, people, I assume if they go find you on Twitter or find your website, you'll, they'll be able to catch up with you and read some more of your work. Right. I have a, I have a website with my husband, uh, poetsandparents.com. So there's a lot of links to the poems there. That's and awesome. The book comes out in February of next year. So Perfect. you can order it now. Okay. Well then everyone go pre-order right now and then you'll learn what other goddesses were created. That, oh. in fact, cause that was the other, I, sorry, I completely missed that topic, but the, on the topic of scars and things like that, that, um, uh, self-acceptance to a degree, you know, and that, and that, um, I don't know. I love it when people kind of make up their own religions because I feel like most of the religions we have have been hanging around too long and aren't really working anymore. Um, I, maybe that's going to offend everyone. I don't know. I'm sorry. But, <laughs> <laughs> but like, you know, it, creating your own understandings of, of, of hope and power and faith in something is so important, you know, especially given, I guess, the things we talked about with your, well, with the reality of our world and, and your other work. So anyway, um, thank you so much for coming. I re really appreciate it. Uh, thank you. All right, everybody, we are, we are cooking. We are definitely cooking. All right, our next reader is Saida Agostini. Yes, 
She is a queer Afro-Guyanese poet whose work explores the ways that Black folks harness mythology to enter the fantastic. Perfect. Um, Saida's poetry can be found in Barrel House Magazine, the Black Ladies Brunch Collective's anthology, Not Without Our Laughter, and other publications. Her first collection of poems, Just Let the Dead In, was a finalist for the Center of African American Poetry and Poetics 2020 Book Prize, as well as the New Issues Poetry Prize. Her chapbook, Stunt, a mythical reimagining of the life of Nellie Jackson, Madam of Natchez, will be released by Neon Hemlock Press in fall 2020. Akave Kanem, a uh, graduate fellow, Saida has been awarded honors and, and support for her work by the Watering Hole and Blue Mountain Center, as well as a 2018 Rubies Grant funding travel to Guyana to support the completion of her first manuscript. Her Twitter handle is her name, uh, which I will just post into the chat. But first, she can unmute herself and Saida, if you'd like to start, I'll just put your Twitter in the chat for you. Awesome. Thank you so much. And I also have to tell you, Ridge, like, I love your voice. Like, I want you to narrate my life. Like, it just, just, you could just be like, Saida has entered the room. Thank you. Um, so I'm really, really excited to be here and excited to put on real clothes. Um, so I'm going to read y'all a few poems. Um, and yeah, so let's get started. This one is called Two Fat Black Women Are Making Love. And the joke is right there ready, shuddering and alive, rife with promise. There are so many paths that have been worn out for a quick, easy laugh. Tyler Perry strutting with a gun and wig, screaming rotund and loud like a Medea would. Martin calling out your mama on television or the meme of a young woman shot underhand, her belly in love with a tight skirt, hands moving towards an open mouth. Look at everything she devours. Imagine it. Does it make you hungry too? Two fat black women are making love on a bed on the floor and they are weeping for joy. They are crying, great folds of flesh, flushing and shaking. One cannot look into the mirror save for thinking of her daddy. All this ugly in skin together counts the men who say they hate her body as they do bitter cops and dead black boys. Two fat black women are making love and they touch each other like they can hold it honeyed, profane body, like patriots, like their bodies have never been folded into freezers, screamed at on streets, coaxed or threatened, sweet, like they have names, like we will know them. So this poem um, is actually gonna be going into something new and shout out to Terry for helping me think it through. It's called A Short Sermon on Black Death. My grandfather got up every morning and prayed until he could not. I remember the way he rose from bed with the threads of dawn breaking over lonely black curls clinging to his bare head, wrinkled knees crooning to wooden planks, how he honored God for every single aching thing, air, his wife, his own voice, six children, the unending journey from Guyana to this still corner attic in Brooklyn. For all this, I'm not saying he was a good man or even a bad one, but there is something exquisite in gratitude, the meticulous accounting of joy. I was with him when he died, 86, cradled in a clean bed, my granny beseeching, Victor, don't leave me. Her Bible between them, wailing daughters garbed in white, flocked around like pulsing lilies. It is enough for me that he died in his own bed by no one's hands except the divine. I think of that this morning, all the dangers we must travel, the monster soothe just to find sleep and wake without fear, enthrall with the dawning loveliness of my own breath, to rise from bed, fall on my knees before the sun, name each trembling grace like my forefathers, fugitive mercies that teach us how to live, even as a great dragon sleeps in our home, feral and coiled, a scaled undulating fire. Is this what my grandfather sought to study in those quiet restless days I laid sheltered in their bed? 
between him and my granny, not yet fluent in the awe of our survival, his knee still on the floor, a lament, searching. So this, these, this one actually comes from um, my chat book on Nellie Jackson's stunt. Nellie Jackson is this dope ass black woman in Natchez, Mississippi, who ran um, a brothel for 60 years, actually from like 1930 to 1990 with the full consent of everyone. So she basically ran Natchez um, and I'm obsessed with her. And so uh, this poem is called Stunt, which is after the title of the chapbook. And there is an epigraph from the Bible. And it says, then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided. I poured over this good book a weathered catalog of men desperate to win their own unsteady kingdom, studied a theology born of desire, flesh, and fire. Read each psalm over and over and found power singing in each word. Child, this is what men want to be made a sorcerer, eyes rolled back, knees dropped to sacred ground, to speak in tongues, visions of a burning bush, magic lions suborned in a red eclipsed rapture, a world shuddering to balance with their wonder. Baby, we all want to be marvelous. That's what I sell, a chance to stunt. Thank you. It's Aida. Thank you so much. The, uh, I, I appreciate um, starting and ending with on, on sort of positive notes. It doesn't have to. It's just I'm, I'm trying to I always try to organize my thoughts, particularly with poems, because uh, there can be such varied topics in them. I guess I'll just go chronologically. The first one, you know, uh, uh, I see a lot of um, uh, body positivity, self-acceptance talk on, on the internet, it's rare that I actually hear it in a way that makes me believe the person feels it. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's rare that someone is doing it in a way that doesn't seem performative or trying to help others, but maybe some insecurity there. Like that poem just speaks to joy and, and like being able to be in a moment with another person and and thinking briefly, like, yeah, if other people saw this, they might say they don't like it or something. But like, at the, at the same time, it's like, who cares? We're here right now. The rest of the world doesn't exist. And I think there's like, there's a, a really universal beauty to that because those are the experiences we have with other people that like fill up our metaphor, you know, our spiritual tank, right? Like mm -hmm. whether, it's, whether it's necessarily sexual or otherwise, like the moments when we can actually just be with another person and forget what we look like and what we're doing and all this stuff. Um, so I really just, I, I really enjoyed that. And your language is so, uh, someone I just saw, I think um, Michelle wrote in there, playful, sassy, and divine. And I think those are very good words for your language choices. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I agree with those. Those work for me. <laughs> nice. Yeah. And then, um, the, you know, the second poem about your grandfather, obviously, um, there's, there's, the juxtaposition of of loss with the amount of potential loss faced by certain people in America, particularly and in the world, mm -hmm. um, really poignant and like reframing, you know, his death as like a good death in a way, um, I think is, you know, and even with, you, you mentioned, um, in the poem, your, your grandmother asked, you know, saying like, don't, don't go or whatever. like, even with that, even with that degree of loss, it's still better than it could have been. And, you know, maybe arguably because of the um, time period he lived through and when he came to this country, maybe better than it, it should have been in some ways. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, I think that's immensely powerful as well. Um, yeah. So that, uh, I guess was that was that um, feeling or that sense? Is that something you got from like a lot of hours of contemplation on this, or is that more? Uh, even at the time, you sort of thought like, well, you know, he 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 had a good ending. 
you know, honestly, at the time, like, I don't, you know, I think anytime, like, we lose someone that, mm -hmm. like, is our kin, like, it's, it's hard to kind of think about it, like, as, like, a, a good or a bad thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, well, it, it was tremendously painful, and, like, he had been in a lot of pain, and if you knew, like, my grandfather, like, he was a incredibly stubborn man, so he was like, I'm going. Mm -hmm. This is, this is simple, you know, um, <laughs> that's who my grandfather was, but it was, there was so much pain, right? Um, and still at the same time, like thinking about kind of all of the ways in which, like I was, I was on the phone with some friends and I was talking about like what, you know, if I was murdered, right? Like, I don't want to be remembered. Like, I think that's my pain, like around folks like Breonna Taylor, yeah. um, so many of the black trans women who have been killed and, mm. you know, like, I don't want to be remembered because I was shot down by the police or by like the KKK or white supremacists. And that's something that that's a gift that my grandfather has. And it's mm. really odd to think about that as a privilege. Right. Mm. Um, and so I think I've been trying to write that poem for a really long time. Like he died about two years ago, mm. a year ago, actually. And I think, um, I was able to just, when I started thinking of it as a sermon, like, like the mm. fact that I was actually trying to talk about the fact that this, it shouldn't be a, it shouldn't be a blessing, but this mm. is actually a blessing. Um, I think that was able to help me frame it. Mm. Yeah, that, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. And I think, uh, you know, to your point about what, you know, unfortunately a lot of people who otherwise should be here leading normal, healthy lives, what, unfortunately what they're, what they will be remembered for is as sort of like, I don't know how to put it. It's so sad because it's almost like a martyrdom in a way because their name will be spoken over and over. But the problem is that martyrs, saints, people who died for causes, it usually feels more like it advanced a cause. Mm -hmm. And, and there's this strange mix that really, um, I find really overwhelming thinking about, you know, when you, if you really sit down and read not about the news, not about the police proceedings, not about the, but if you read about, say, Breonna Taylor's life, and you get a good understanding of who she was as a human being. Mm -hmm. It's so pointless and awful that she died. And, th and that that's how, like you said, that her name will be a name in a fact book now. Mm -hmm. Um. I've kind of worked myself into a hole. I apologize. I'm sorry. I got really lost in thought, but I, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to make light of anything, but it's just, it is, it almost, it's worth taking the time to think about that so that we understand that because we know her name for that, it is our duty to do something about it so that other people are not added to that list. Yeah. I, I think that's the best way I can say it. And it's also, important in a way when thinking about people like your grandfather people like others it's important in a way to focus on that because that shouldn't be true either mm -hmm. yeah. so yeah. really again poetry mesmerizing me and going internal and just moving things around and i love it i really deeply appreciate it so thank you for sharing thank you sure all right um our final reader tonight is Brian Petcash. Uh, his award-winning stories have appeared in Midwestern Gothic and Southward, amongst other publications. Mistakes by the Lake, a <laughs> sorry, that's a fantastic title, a collection of Cleveland-centric stories published by Madville Publishing is out now. Born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio, Brian currently lives in Tampa, Florida, where he remains an avid fan of Cleveland sports. Uh, for more, you can visit his website, which I put in the chat right there. And otherwise, Brian, you can unmute and take it away. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Trina and Ridge, for letting me be a part of this. Um, I am just honored to be meeting alongside such talented writers. So thank you all for sharing your work. Uh, and I'm also so grateful that uh, so many have decided to tune in and hear us read, including uh, my partner Celeste is here and a lot of my family, which is really neat to see. So thank you all for, for being here. The, um, the collection of stories, Mistakes by the Lake, is uh, it's 10 stories, well, nine stories and, and the title track novella that, that caps the collection. 
And all the stories are set in Cleveland in various decades of the city's history, starting from 1796 and then working all the way up to 2013. The uh, story I'm going to read tonight, I'm just going to read the first couple scenes from the 1928 story, and it's called The Last Ride. When Oswald won track O'Malley was six years old, Abraham Lincoln's visit changed his life, kindled in the young lad a want, no, a need, to do something by which he remembered. That morning, all those years ago, young Oswald was awakened by the sound of cannon fire, cannon fire, cannon fire. His father, pus snowflaking an eye patch received in a mill accident, urged Oswald out of bed. He's coming. While his father dressed Oswald in a too small black suit that was his in miniature, he said, you'll see son, this man, goodness made him great. Oswald didn't understand why viewing the body of a dead president, one making his final journey back to Illinois, was so special. People thronged public square. Young Oswald shifted from foot to foot, peered between the tightly packed and solemn crowd. He glimpsed snatches of the gray sky, the tops of buildings, a bit of Perry's monument, and beyond it, a flag-topped pavilion. Rain began in a light drizzle, then within minutes turned into a steady curtain parted only by the emergence of six brilliantly white horses gleaming in the mist. Oswald released his father's hand. The rain created a mix of puddles and muddy patches through which Oswald moved. The horses were festooned with crepe detailed with small rosettes and silver stars. Time slowed for Oswald as the horse's somber gait piaffed to the raindrops splashing in the street rippling the puddles. Behind the horse's trail, the finely crafted hearse bearing the body of the country's president. Tapestries of black velvet and of red, white, and blue dripped from the hearse. The horses stopped. Several men carried the coffin to its temporary resting place in the middle of public square. A band played a dirge and its powerful solemnity startled young Oswald. Time quickened. He had lost his father in the crowd. After moments of panic and incorrect adults, he found his right hand safely gripping the threadbare sleeve of his father's coat. Through the noise of the rain, young Oswald heard phrases that sound like prayer, the Lord hath taken away, and man hath a short time to live, and life is full of misery. The pious words filled his bowed head. The crowd surged, movement pushing him and his father first toward, then away from the president's catafalque. Oswald couldn't see. Bodies pressed against him. His one-eyed father tugged him closer, draped his arm over Oswald's shoulder and chest. The newspaper plugging the holes in Oswald's shoes had long since given way to rain and mud. He shivered. Oswald thought no one could be this important. No man this praiseworthy to warrant such a display. The fifth hour, young Oswald, hungry, sullen, angry, thought the rain had stopped as he entered the pavilion. But he heard the drop, drop, up on the covering above, knew he was wrong, and he heard the dripping gasps and sobs and mutterings of shameful and too sorrowful and what of our country. When he saw the foot of the casket, young Oswald marveled at the length of it. A white-bearded gentleman held aloft a young girl at the open end, and when he whispered something to her, she nodded seriously. Oswald hoped his father would hold him high. Standing on tiptoe, young Oswald moved up the casket, the finest mahogany his father had later told him, and his hand flew quickly to cover his mouth, shocked at the serene and hirsute face. Oswald pumped up and down on his toes. Lincoln's face was leaden, the eyes deeply sunk. The thin lips seemed glued together. Given the spectacle, young Oswald almost expected these lips to part, utter a joke or a phrase of condolence to the distraught city. He reached out a shaking hand to touch one of the petals that comprised the large floral AL resting on Lincoln's chest. His father swatted Oswald's hand away. Show some respect. Oswald took in the scene and he knew what he wanted a life of awe that might someday cause some future father to swat a child's hand away, a life that would generate this kind of sadness. So it was Abraham Lincoln's fault, 
That simple truth insinuated itself daily into Oswald O'Malley's thoughts near the end of his 12-hour shift. Oswald, now 69 years old, stood outside his electric streetcar, his dinky, and pulled the trolley rope down, releasing the spring-loaded trawler from the overhead wires. He shuffle-footed his way to the opposite end of trolley number 111, feet dusting through the sand he'd forced over the tracks moments before, and swung the center and swivel-mounted pole behind him. Once he had it lined up, he eased the tension on the rope so the trawler snubbed against the wire. He tied off the loose end of rope to a metal loop on the side of the car, clapped his hands several times to warm them against the late October Cleveland cold, and readied for his return trip to the West Side Market. It was a short run, his route. Of a mile. He heard that now, in 1928, there were over 400 miles of track in Cleveland. 400, and here he was. Oswald O'Malley, delegated, delegated to a back and forth trolley covering less than a single mile. Six stops, three minutes to run one length, a two minute layover at each end. Every hour he'd raise and lower the trolley pole 12 times. That meant in his three decades as Abbey Avenue motorman, he had, when his mind drifted toward working the math to the tens of thousands of miles traveled on the single stretch of track, he became lightheaded with fear, queasy with loss. Out of habit, he mentally recited a mantra that had served him well early on, a mantra that for a time heralded a brighter day. This is only temporary. He had once believed that. It was only a few weeks after that sad and glorious day in the rain, after disassembling his mother's Singer sewing machine to see how it worked, after discovering he had an aptitude for such things, that young Oswald became a tinkerer, an inventor. His father encouraged Oswald to use his gifts to get out of Irish Town Bend, to avoid the kind of hard labor that had nearly taken his life, but instead settled for his eye. Oswald tinkered and invented, tinkered and invented. This would be his escape. This would be how he would inspire awe. When he was 15, he'd invented a substitute for collar buttons that could be fastened and unfastened with one hand. Then he learned they'd already been invented. This was the first of many such failures. After a time, Oswald needed money, needed to live, and when he married at 17, he needed to support Mary, a young woman who at first found his inventing charming, cute even, but who later, later found Oswald's obsession infuriating. Within years of his first working for the railway as a teen, his temporary morphed into a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday rhythm of waking dinky, eating dinky, eating, tinkering, sleeping. For years, he thought the weariness of that rhythm would provoke a long dormant consciousness into action, or at the very least, bring him some goddamn luck. A light rain mixed with sleet now began to fall. With his West 14th layover finished, he pedaled the bell once to signal his departure, revolved the control to pick up speed and lever open a chute that air blasted sand over the rails to battle the icy and final runs of the evening. The dinky became obstreperous as it approached West 15th, Old Burn Street. The weather and time worn track that tra transitioned from 15th to the bridge attempted to jolt the dinky offline, and the trolley pole swayed from side to side as Oswald's right hand, his good hand, automatically worked the braking valve to direct air to the cylinder under the car and then the westerly crisis averted, just as automatically revolved the controller to regain his speed during this long stopless stretch until West 19th. At his busiest, Oswald transported over 2,000 riders a day. The passengers he ferried this evening, two men drunkenly japed about a chicken in every garage and a car in every pot, and a couple who, Oswald knew, were married to other people but for some reason found his dinky romantic faced across from each other on the two wooden benches that ran lengthwise along the inside of the car. They abruptly lurched forward with the initial jolt, then skidded backward with the acceleration. One of the men said, Oi, watch it, then tossed an empty milk bottle in Oswald's direction. Oswald stopped the dinky, dropped his head back, and counted the gold painted flowers that trimmed the olive green ceiling, flowers he had counted millions of times, probably. When he reached 30, he opened the doors, pointed without turning around, and the drunks departed as they muttered lackluster threats about reporting Oswald to management. 
Oswald One Track O'Malley lived and lost his life in tiny increments along Abbey Avenue. Thank you. All right, thank you, Brian. That's uh, I. It was a very easy story for me to get lost in. I think that the the this the time period and the the occupation, but especially the failed inventor status, you know, of of. Uh, uh, sort of goes back to that like American dream kind of vibe again, because especially in that in that time period, there were so many people. You know, it was this boom of technology and this boom of everything, and and everyone, if you just had the right idea, you could get to it. And then it, I love that he goes to patent it, and it turns out someone already invented it. Um, also, just starting with the um, you know the mixed sort of mixed reaction to. Uh, a, a president, a dead president, right? Uh, starting with that sort of like, first of all, it's with any situation in which there's a, a dead body, a uh, funeral, uh, memorial service, anything like that, nobody knows what to do. Everybody does silly things. We all make mistakes and stuff and say weird stuff and try to touch things or not touch things. Um, and then second of all, you know, there was a line in there that was something like, nobody could be this important. Was that what it was? Yeah, no one could inspire this kind of awe. That's what it is. No one could inspire this kind of awe. And it is this sort of strange um, uh, strange thing where uh, people can bring that into a situation where they, they can so greatly admire somebody or they can so greatly admire someone's office or occupation that, that they're, to someone who doesn't have that built in or hasn't learned that yet, it seems bizarre. And I think that's also a good way to establish sort of the character as maybe thinking about things a way that some people don't or, or sort of differently. So I, it really just, it, it, it's an interesting event to pick. Now is the, the book you said it goes through stories and it's through the history of Cleveland effectively? It is effectively, you know, it's uh, every story is set in a different decade. The first story starts in 1796 with uh, the sort of discovery of the area mm. um, and the, the search of that area, the Western Reserve, um, and then 1928, and then it just moves uh, through each decade successively through there. Okay, that's got to be fascinating because I know, you know, I, I have a, first of all, I didn't realize we usually have some people from Ohio with us. I did not realize there would be this amount of love for Cleveland tonight. This is great. I saw it uh, too. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, yeah ter <laughs> Terry's there. She's in Maryland now, but her heart is in Cleveland. And interesting fact, the Huey Lewis song, The Heart of Rock and Roll, where he says the heart of rock and roll is still beating, written by him originally as the heart of rock and roll is in Cleveland. Just saying. So, uh, I mean, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame's there and everything. But I know, what I was going to say is knowing a few people from Ohio, you know, I know especially cities like Cleveland, uh, Cincinnati, a lot of these Midwestern cities, the trajectory of the economy, particularly in them, you know, going decade by decade, you had this tremendous boom of prosperity and the, the building of suburbs and subdivisions and classic sort of what we think of as like classic America. And then just the steep decline with manufacturing moving away, all this stuff. So I, I can see why um, it would give you that really broad spectrum. Um, the only question I want to ask is, does everyone in the book, in the, do each, does each main character actually make a mistake? It might be a silly question. <laughs> More or less, they do. Yeah. Okay. Cool. I mean, of course, the the the, the bad nickname for Cleveland is mistake, by the way. But yes. um, the characters themselves, yeah, that's that's part of their it's, it's part of their journey. Is they fall, <laughs> okay, they fall into a bit of misfortune. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. All right. Well, awesome. Well, that's that's uh, can't, that's fantastic. And the book is available now. It is. Yeah. Okay. So people who want you know if, want to read more, please. Go find that as well. I don't know if anyone posted. We need to, I need to remember. Oh, there is a link if you scroll up in the chat uh, to it on bookshop.org, which by the way, we highly recommend uh, because it does not give money to Amazon or other very large organizations. It finds you a local bookstore that you can get a book from, which is awesome. So anyway, Brian, thank you so much. Uh, and I'm seeing right here that it is 9.01 PM. So I'm a little bit over, I apologize. But uh, I just want to say, um, from myself, Trina, and our new uh, 
Executive Vice President of Talent Relations, Noli. Uh, thank you all so much for coming. Uh, thank you so much to the readers. It's it's also really just really nice to see so many like new faces and also new names. Um, obviously, we have some people who come every week. We would love it if you all came every week. Um, I know there's not a whole lot to do on uh, uh, Friday night right now, uh, safely at least, but we like to think this is one. And I have, you know, I always say that selfishly, like I get so much inspiration and connection out of this experience. I really hope that everyone feels like even half of what I get to feel because it's just wonderful to, the original title of this was The Great Indoors, which was a fun pun. It turned out there were like 20 other things called that. But what I really meant by that was inside other people's heads, Walk, walk a mile in somebody's shoes, try on a different perspective, work on developing empathy, realizing that people are people. It makes moral choices so much simpler in your life. That's all I'll say. So again, if you or anyone you know would like to read on the show, um, please pass them along to Noli. Um, I don't know if she wants to put her email out there, I assume. You can get her on Twitter in any way, Noli Reed. Um, and with that, I'm going to stop recording right now say 